Um, so we got the action grant submitted on time. Um, and it's got acknowledgement, so we know it went in. It was uh, it was quite a process to get that all in. Um, but the select board uh, did vote to approve it and submitted a letter of support and match certification, so that was great. Um, select board already knows all of this information, so just kind of by quick by way of quick update for you. We have to open our meeting, Carolyn. Yeah, I think we better, Tim. Um, yeah. I will make a motion to open up the, or I will open up the select board meeting at 1122. Thank you. Thank you, Tim, for reminding me. Chris, were you able to scan the, the different handouts? Yes, I'm working on it right now and I'll be able to screen share. Sorry for short notice on that. Oh, no, it's all good. So we we ended up uh, submitting a, a grant that totaled um, $336,000. And the, um, the local match on it um, was uh, a total of $98,000 like, after we got um, match commitments from Frontier Regional. And I also factored in doing some of the Leary lot engineering work as match. Um, we ended up with only $36,000 in actual cash match that the town needed to come up with. So that seemed to make it more palatable. And, um, and then there was 18,000 in leftover MVP. So it really is only 18 or 19,000. Right. Yes. So it seems like that that's all doable. And um, so we submitted it based on that. Um, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that just because you guys have all heard all of it before. Yeah. Yep. Um, what I would like to talk in more detail about is the MVP 2.0 um, grant, which we which I also submitted last week. Um, and it's been accepted by the state. Um, the deadline for this one isn't until May 18th. Um, so it's still, you know, a few days off. But I expect the turnaround on the MVP 2.0 to be much more um, quick. Um, the turnaround for the action grants is we won't hear until um, September. That's very helpful, Chris. Thank you. Um, so this is a description of the MVP 2.0, and what's important to know about this is that um, there's no match, first of all. Um, it's state-funded entirely. It's a two-year program, um, and we expect to hear um, probably in, I would imagine, in June, because the, the program actually starts in July. Um, and the first year... I think it's, uh, I'm just looking for the numbers here. First year is $45,000 for um, what are shown as steps uh, phase one and two of, of this program. Chris, if you could scroll down just a little bit on that document to the lower part. There we go, perfect. So if you see phase one and two here, um, phase one is developing a core team that's five months worth of work. Um, so in our case, we would be working on expanding the existing core team um, and then revisiting the community's resilience priorities. Um, this is a, a focus on not just not really redoing the MVP plan, but sort of revisiting it with a focus on social resilience and community resilience. Um, and there's a real emphasis here on engaging the broader community and some of the, um, the most impacted communities in, in town. Um, so for example, seniors. Chris, yeah, Chris, I think this is gonna work really well for us because you know we're trying to do the Deerfield yard, 2030 yard by yard program from a mental health point of view, you know, people, you know, I have, 
I know I've said this before in public, but it is really important to understand that people were really isolated and felt powerless in the pandemic. People that I spoke to, you know, the 3,000 people that were infected with COVID over the term of the pandemic. And, um, and then our also climate change kids feel, you know, that's why we tried to emphasize working with the kids and the healthy soils and everything is because kids feel like they have no control over climate. And, and, and why the reality is if China and India don't participate, then yeah, there's really not a lot to do, but if no matter how little, whether you have a uh, window box or you have a large yard or a big meadow or a farm, we we feel that you can make impact in your own backyard. And that's why we're doing the yard by yard. It's to give, empower our community, empower our youth to do something positive. And so I feel like this is going to fit beautiful. Excellent. And Carolyn, um, if folks want to sign up for the Yard by Yard program, how do they do that? Well, this is a problem. The state has been dragging their feet. We were supposed to hear in December, the conservation district was supposed to get a $49,000 grant to complete this, to do the Yard by Yard program. And here it is, May, and they keep promising that it's done. So we're going to hear any, any, any time and we've been hearing for every time, any time since December. So I know they're going to release the money. I'm sure they're going to release the money before Ju Ju June first or Ju July first because it's money from this year. And I'm hoping that they will give us, you know, fis two fiscal years to spend it. So we're going to have a little bit of a pot of money, forty nine thousand dollars to work with uh, Deerfield and Leiden and Hallamont Elementary School. We're doing a, a project at Hallamont Elementary School and the up in the town of Leiden and, and in Deerfield. So there is a little bit of money for that. And that's to hire consultants, that's to buy plants, that's to do basically what we started with Owen. We're, it's to continue working with Owen, actually, Owen Wormser. So that's just for the just for the schools. It sounds like, right? No, no. It's it's. We were able to. Um, David Pomerantz from Leiden uh, is working with the select board in Leiden, and that's how we got into Leiden because he's on the board conservation board with me, and I'm chair of the conservation district. And of course, that's how we got into Deerfield because I, you know, it was my idea to empower people to to use their backyard and, and feel empowered by working in their own plot, however big or small it is, and have control and have more mental resilience. And the focus is along the Bloody Brook. And that is from another grant before where, you know, we were trying to figure out ways to mitigate the flooding along Bloody Brook. Because every time you have a rain event, it threatens people's homes along Bloody Brook. So, you know, the idea is to work on those communities that are at risk for flooding along the Bloody Brook. And we did, we, we, have, we had a pretty good turnout for our, our one public meeting with Owen Wormser. We had three or four people that had property along Bloody Brook sign up and work to work with Owen. And we as a town are gonna work with Owen um, because part of the municipal campus project is the wetlands delineations are being done right now by Berkshire Design and then they're inventorying the vase invasives along Bloody, Bloody Brook which is basically poison ivy and knotweed and sumac that kind of stuff so that we can dig it up get rid of it and then plant uh, Owen is supposed to um, train our highway department how to maintain a buffer and we are going to, in the conservation district would we'll be working with the highway department on a buffer of native plants um, that would be a pollinator garden and have deep roots so that would mitigate flooding when it does occur. So it's kind of exciting actually. So um, I guess what I'm, I'm trying to figure out is if, if, a, if I'm a resident and I wanna sign up for the yard by yard program, what, what do I do? 
Well, we had that original meeting and we had to sign up, I don't know, maybe 30 people signed up from consulting. So we would have another public meeting when we know we have some money. <laughs> as soon as we get this grant, we'll have a couple, we can hire Owen again to have another couple meetings to give a presentation. And then if people are interested, they can sign up through those public outreach meetings. Okay. And is there a cost to do it? Mm -mm, it's free. We were giving out books and okay. kinds of information. So, um, Chris, so possibly um, if we get this, we get this, is phase one and phase two simultaneous? No. Oh, no, they, they, they're sequential. So it's a, it's a two year program altogether. So five months on phase one, five months on phase two, and then 13 months on phase three in sequence. And then, and then there's there's like 49,000 the first year and 50,000 the second or something like that. 45,000 the first year and 50 the second. Okay. And the reason why I was asking is that um, there will be yet another opportunity for the yard by yard if you if you piggyback along this phase two you know to community engagement priorities uh, maybe we can get more people to sign up yeah yeah i mean there was a lot of interest there was a beautiful day and i was i was so worried no one was coming and we had like 40 something people there it was pretty amazing that's excellent well i i for example would sign up for it i wasn't able to make it that day because i had a family event but um i would sign up for it i think there's probably a lot of other folks that would you know, if we did a little more um, outreach and publicity, that would be good. Um, but, I would I would assume that we're going to get this grant. I mean, we the grant money has already been set aside. So I'm assuming that we're going to get it. It's just they've got to approve it and release the money um, because it's part of the environmental bond bill. So it has to be released. And um, so I'm assuming that we're going to get it. And I'm assuming, too, that they have to do it before July 1st. So no matter what, we're gonna hear in the next few weeks. So that's a good thing. And then Great. we'll be able to do more with Owen. It's just, as a conservation district, we don't really have any money. So unless we get the grant money, we really can't keep hiring Owen. Right. Mm -hmm. and does a question that um, yard by yard should hopefully involve something more than just Meadows, because some people who, who can't or aren't interested in meadows still want to be part of yard by yard oh yes yes the idea the whole idea owen is just for people that want to convert lawn into meadows and, and we were like trying to focus in the center of town kind of thing to absorb more water because water is the issue and so by having deeper rooted uh, native plants you have more pollinators but you're also sucking up more water so that was sort of the focus of our first start, but it's definitely focused on whether you got a window box or you, or how big your yard is, Annalee. It's for anybody. So, um, I, I, uh, I was um, wondering if there was any, uh, any available for helping communities um, buy seed or or in other words we have two potential meadows we are now our own HOA and uh, if there's any you know whether whether we've already had Owen once of course having Owen again is probably good um, and we have some four or five people who've committed to pay to convert to meadows, the lawns are, I'm, this is the, in the back area behind some great big areas behind the condos. And, uh, but I think, you know, it's going to be expensive digging up all that nice new lawn, new lawn they planted. And, um, and we've got to get buy-in from the community. So is there any, help that we can get since it's 75 house 70 households um 
I I would say that the conservation district would would be willing, you know, to 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 work with you as an uh, homeowners association for sure. But I don't know, I don't know how much money, um, you know, just offsetting plants because obviously a huge area like that is much more than somebody's little strip next to Bloody Brook. So, um, right. you know, plant wise, it's pretty expensive. You know, we gave away um, trays of plants and each tray was between $120, $100 and $120. And that would be uh, not a very big size area. Right, I, th I think what we would be doing is I mean Owen was talking about seat doing a lot of seeding and not a lot of plugs, so it would be cheaper, but uh, for a large area. But um, Owen was gonna, I mean, even just paying for Owen to do some of the planning and and uh, you know we've got we've got workers and we've got some money uh, committed, maybe like I don't know five or six thousand dollars, but uh, and I don't know maybe we would get more. Um, but first we have to get community buy-in. So, um, you know, it's a process. Right. I, I think the biggest concern is people so, are worried about uh, in, endorsement from the town, you know, would be terrific. Yeah. I, I the biggest pushback is, is tip. You're getting a lot of cut out. Is that, are other people? Yeah, you know, you're cutting out. I'm cutting out too. I don't understand what's wrong with my internet, but yeah, sorry. What we have to do is work with Owen to come up with some um, response, a, a good re public health response for the tick question, because everybody has concern about ticks. If we put the meadow in, are we going to have more ticks? And, you know, we got to come up with something that and, and a, a game plan for that concern. So I, uh, um, you know, because it, truthfully mowing the lawn on a regular basis, like once or twice a week is gonna keep your tick population down. So uh, like Deerfield Academy and those areas, there's just no ticks in old Deerfield between the pesticides and herbicides that they use and all the mowing and leaf blowing. And, so there's just no ticks. Whereas you come up to my, you know, at Victoria's place, but if you come up here, there's a ton of ticks. So I understand what people are saying. So we need to work with Owen before we get push the whole metal thing too yeah. much. And that's going to be your concern, I think, MA. I agree. I agree. So um, we'll keep working on it. Yeah. Just so Chris can go through this, can we? Try yeah. to focus on this one back versus... to the MVP 2.0. It's great that yard by yard is is you know synced up with this really well, but it, it this is a separate issue of the MVP 2.0. Um, so the first two phases, um, there will be a um, you know a consulting team that the town will need to um, to have to work on that. Um, I would like to do a, a stay involved with this process as much as possible, but I, you know, I, I would imagine bringing in and maybe forming a consultant team that has people who, who specialize in um, equity issues and um, social resilience and so forth. And so I wanted to make mention of that to the select board because you will be asked to, to put together a, a consultant team to do the first two phases of this. Um, and then the third phase would be a separate consulting team. Um, and I want to talk a little bit more about that because we've we've begin we've be, begun a discussion about what might be in that seed project. And I and I think we've got some interesting ideas emerging, and I wanted to share those with the rest of the group. Um, we talked about, you know, we've talked for a long time about the healthy soils um, plan and how it wanted state award from the APA and wanting to do some work to implement that. Um, some of that work would be potentially um, bylaw work with the planning board, but um, some additional ideas that have come up are um, working with the farmers um, in town to try to do some stream um, buffer protection um, in cases, particularly, for example, where we have um, livestock 
you know, grazing into our, our streams and rivers and causing some significant impacts to those areas. As a town, it, you know, it served us well, as was referenced earlier with Carolyn's comment about Bloody Brook, to try to, you know, establish buffers along our streams that are, um, that are not being um, degraded and eroded um, and to encourage sort of a natural stream corridor. Um, so working with farmers on that as part of the seed project, I think could be a really great match with the, the other healthy soils work that we're talking about. And um, just, I wanted to just mention that I have next door neighbors that have this problem <laughs> with their, um, their far, uh, farming operation, which involves um, beef cattle. Um, and um, talk to them about potentially participating in a program like this. And, and they were very interested in that. Um, and Steve and Julie Chalfant um, from Roaming Farm. And then I was thinking about the Melnick Farm. Um, Tim and I talked about this a little bit, um, has a similar problem with the Deerfield River main stem and also a tributary that comes in through their farm um, that are really degraded. And if, if you are, for example, if you're kayaking on the, or canoeing on the Deerfield River, you go by the Melnick farm, after just downstream from that, the entire bottom of the Deerfield River turns green. <laughs> it's, it's like visually extremely noticeable. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, fertilizer and, and other things going into the river there. And having a stream bank, bank buffer would be great for water quality, but it's also a it's also a flood protection mechanism, and that's kind of what we're about in Deerfield with this MVP program is trying to manage flood impacts. So anyway, I think those are some exciting ideas, and I just wanted to throw those out for um, possible discussion. You know, and and we could potentially work. Um, I could put together a team with uh, with regenerative design and Keith Zaltzberg to um, be involved with this piece of if that's what the town wants to do. Um, and there might be some other folks that we bring in for expertise as well. Well, I think that um, that's a really good idea because NRCS um, is focused on trying to do that, you know, funding um, that kind of work um, through their equip programs. And we're gonna have, well, who knows what's gonna happen, but um, supposedly there's, two or three times the normal amount of money coming into the state. So if we can work with Julie and her um, farm, for sure, that would be fabulous. I, I'm not sure about um, Faraway Farm. They have they know that they have a problem and they have not been easy to work with in the, as a, in the past on this, but um, they also know that, you know, there is going to, going to be some regulatory issues because um, DEP has been sampling the water. So I would approach them as this is proactive. We're here to help you and we have funding source, NRCS, Natural Resource and Conservation Service. And certainly we, we can even hook them up with people right away. Um, you know, we have people that can work with them right away. So I would say that was a win-win for everybody. I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm willing to help work with the barway folks. Oh, excellent. Oh, you know, but, um, but we, need, um, we need help. Yes, I, I can try to work with you on what is available through NRCS so we can get that all sorted out before you. That would be great. If I had the information, I'm happy to go and talk to them. Yep. You know, I'd, I'd be happy to work with you on that too, Ma. That that sounds great. You know, just to have someone. Are you familiar with the family, and um, we get kind of a foot in the door that way? Yes. Boy, um, Dan. Tim has a hand up. I have two hands up. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I would like to suggest that um, if we are going to continue in phase three with a consultant. Um, we should get that person to work with NRCS. And I think, Carolyn, you're, you've identified the correct approach is that, you know, <clears throat> let's get ahead of this before the before the government starts 
looking for enforcement. Um, you know, we want to we want your farm to succeed. Blah blah blah. Um, you know, we want to protect the deer field. You know, and you know if we can isolate and keep fertilizer on your land, um, you're gonna have you'll probably have to use less fertilizer. <laughs> You know, so you'll save money. We'll we'll identify financing sources, and let's come up with a plan. Because I think I think the the mill is it the Mill River or is it? Well, the, the mill. Run? In in uh, in my area where the roaming farm is, it's the Mill River. Yeah, exactly. So um, I think if you know we could just identify those two two farms, that would be a great seed project. And if we could drag in NRCS for resources, oh, uh, we would. We, you know, we we could make this fifty thousand dollars be a lot more, because um, I think with the with a bigger industrial farm like the well, I don't know if it's really industrial, but a big farm like the Melnicks, they're going to need resources so that they don't have to take this out of their thin profit margin. Right. Right. No, I think that's the beauty of it is is to get the equip. Um, program to pay for it all, but we, we kind of do the work with the farmers to get them engaged and to think about what kinds of solutions there might be that work and plan it all out so that they don't have to do that work themselves. Yep. And the main, yeah, I was going to say the majority of the problem at Melnixt is the stuff that's across the road of Mill Village, and they're just left, they're, that's all they're just their heifers who are, who are destroying that bank it, it I, I don't think that, i don't think it's a whole lot of fertilizer problem because most of their fertilizer is uh i mean you know a lot of their crops are rented fields miles away in the other towns and everything else i mean they the way they do business is um you know they have some fields there but most of the most of their growing stuff is across at least across a road from the river and, well, and it's those hackers. Is, uh, just a quick interjection. The, the problem is that there's a tributary stream that runs right, right. through the center of their farm and, and it's not fenced at all. So the, the cattle are, the dairy cows are just grazing. I think right it's a relatively, yeah, I think it's a relatively simple problem. Uh, yeah, I think I it's could be wrong, <laughs> But I think, I think that it, it, it's it'll be expensive because it's a big area, but it's it's a relatively simple problem. And if we can approach them with this is what needs to be done, this is the money we have, uh, I I would expect that they would be. They, I mean, they're not all they're not against avoiding degradation of the river. They use the river. They kayak on it. They tube on it. They swim in it. You know, they don't That's want it that way either. So. Oh, excellent. I didn't know yeah, that. So, so I, I don't, I think it's a problem of resources and, yeah. and professional advice. Well, we, what we don't, is saying is that there are resources um, and we just need to make the connection and, and help them access those resources. Absolutely. We don't need to hire a consultant because um, Mass, MACD, the Mass Association of Conservation Districts, which I'm on that board, has already hired people to work with the farmers to, to access the funding um, because NRCS just, they're about a, th uh, a third of the kind of staffing that they used to have years ago. So yeah, um, I guess what I was suggesting about consultants is we need to not let us be the people who are primary responsible for doing this. We need to have somebody who exactly. does this for their job and right. has access to all these people and we use the seed project as a way to design the plan that we want to offer to the farmers. And I had a question for, I don't know if anyone knows, but the Melnicks also have a large cow manure installation across Stillwater. Um, I think it's the Melnicks, sort of as you go towards the bridge, it's on the left-hand well, side. That's, um, that's silage, Tim. No. That's all silage. That's not manure. Flat silage? You drive past there. If you get your car through there, it's cow manure. Oh, is it's, it? It's the one with all the tires piled up on it's top of it. covered. Yeah. I mean, they use it on their fields. 
but I was just wondering if some of it becomes liquid and and in fact they pour they put liquid manure on their fields because it absorbs faster um, but I was just wondering if the stream that goes through it travels that direction does it pick up some of that stuff or is it far enough away that it's not leaching as well so one of the, one of the there. they're, yeah, they're kind of a fair distance apart from each yep. other the stream doesn't go past the cow manure facility but i wouldn't be surprised if there's some drainage that does go across the road and and ends up in the river longer term yeah. but it's not the most immediate problem perhaps that you know yeah, the good. fencing well, issues it. One of the things that's a, a requirement is a conservation plan to participate in NRCS programs. So a conservation plan, if they don't have one, uh, that they can up, I mean, if it's not current, it can be updated. I know Melnix have done NRCS projects before in the past. So um, it just might need to be updated, but that is part of, you know, services offered um, by NRCS through MACD. So um, again, we could connect, find out the status of what's happening on their farm and, and you know, they could work with the appropriate people that would identify all these issues. Yep. Okay. But I agree with Tim. Uh, having a professional do this, it's, it's uh, going to be a, a lot better than having uh, town officials do it. Oh, town officials can't do it. No, I know that. <laughs> yeah, no, I think I think that's all. Just those are none all of great us. Ideas. None of us. That, that our role could be just making that initial connection between the farmers and the equip program. Yeah. Because the equip, equip program's been around a long time, and these farmers are not really using it. So we kind of need to we need to uh, grease the skids and sell sell them on the program and make make it clear that it's not a program that's going to have a lot of uh, major strings attached. When I, when I talked to Roaming Farm, they were really nervous about, you know, this is a federal program, there's all kinds of strings attached, and we, we're not sure we really want to do it. So, you know, trying to get over that hump is what our, our committee's role, you know, could be in the process. Right. Um, well, that, so that's great. Um, so we can talk about all of this more once the MVP 2.0 grant is awarded, which hopefully it will be, I, I think our, our chances are really good given that we were the first community um, certified for MVP in the state. And they're looking for the communities that were in the very early stages that, you know, it's now been five or six years since we've really done our MVP plan and they wanna kind of revisit all of these things. So I, I would say our chances are are really good for the for this grant. The action grant, I, I think, is going to be a lot more competitive because now every almost every community in Massachusetts is an MVP community. So we're competing against you know like 300 communities for for that grant. So that that one will be tougher. Um, just to kind of prepare you for that. Um, so. Um, you know, I just want to be conscious of the time here. I, I want to make sure we have enough time to talk about these other things. We, um, Chris, are you okay for the May 19th uh, deadline? Do you need any? I, it's, it's already been submitted. Okay. So we are, we are all set. So that's that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so if, you, if it's okay with you all, I'd like to move along to the discussion about the tree cutting letter with state legislators. Okay. Um, we had started working on a letter um, and it had been MA's um, initiative to get that started. Um, and then we did some editing on the letter. And Chris, if you, you were able to share the edited version of the letter. Um, and then the other thing is that the Gmail um, message from Lori Busada, those two things would be really helpful. Um, so I wanted to mention that um, I think this letter is, is, is going to be pretty effective, but it might be even more effective if we have other communities sign on to it. And I did talk to the Sunderland Energy Committee 
about uh, signing on and they are interested in that. So I wanted to check in with you all and see if, if that makes sense to you to try to get some of our neighbors to sign on with us to this letter. And then I'd like to also try to do a final edit on the letter and get it, get it finished because we've been kind of um, messing around with this for a couple of meetings now. <laughs> like to try to get it get it to a finished stage. Um, so maybe the first question is, how do you feel about engaging other communities and, and getting them to sign out as well? No question. <laughs> oh, OK. Um, and does anybody have any suggestions or connections with any of our other neighbors that might be good um, to talk to? Uh, Emma has her hand up. Yeah, That's, it's about something different, but given the opportunity, I, of course, will talk. Um, the uh, right now, the energy committees are beginning of the four frontier towns are beginning to have conversations about frontier. But because of that, we've started to have connections with those and and we will probably be having regular meetings with uh people from the four towns um so that is a connection that we could bring up but it it's moving really slowly and uh it's 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 a little uh i don't know we're focused on frontier right now would would you mind ma using those connections to send out your your draft letter once we finish it and polish it up um no i'm, ha so I'm happy to do that Excellent. So I can't again, promise. Sunderland, Sunderland's already talked about it at their meeting, apparently, and they're they're interested. Yeah. Um, I would say the second sentence, the second paragraph, needs to be reworked in some way so that it takes into account that yes, in fact, they do notify us, but they don't notify us in any any form that allows us to have any input. So. It's a, the, the federal government gives these people a large uh, autonomy in dealing with this kind of work. And so we need to say something like, um, does not receive, you know, um, I don't know, s sufficient advance notice um, of where, when, and how much work the contractors will be performing uh, nor is there a mechanism for providing feedback before the work begins, um, you know, because it's factually not true that we don't receive notice. Right. So, um, Chris, if you don't mind um, sharing that Gmail from Lori Busad, I think that's really relevant to this point right now. That, um, Sorry, Laurie's not here. I thought she was going to join us today, but um, Laurie did some really good research work on the um, state law that's uh, removal of public shade trees, Mass General Laws, Chapter 87. And basically, that law says that um, utilities may, um, or at the request of the tree warden, must submit annual vegetation management plans describing the maintenance work and or hazard tree rem removal plan describing the tree re removal work to be performed. So that's the key phrase that influences you know, all of this. So basically, um, the tree warden um, can require or request that the utility submit an annual vegetation management plan. That's, I think, what we really want them to yeah. do. We need to also, I mean, obviously the, the select board can instruct the tree warden to do stuff, but then you also have to have a tree warden that will actually do stuff. Um, and I'm not certain what level of service the tree warden provides for Deerfield. I'm just not, you know, that knowledgeable about but I agree, I think we should frame it in a way that's that's providing state legislative authority to have an influence on what happens. Um, because basically, 
Eversource and, and National Grid rely on the fact that nobody has enough individual bandwidth to deal with these things and they just plow ahead with what they're gonna do. And if we could get four towns and frame it in a way that Natalie could say, yes, there is a state law that impacts this, um, we could maybe move this, uh, maybe even suggest that it spreads through her district, you know, um, ask for buy-in for the her towns and for Joe's towns um, just to see. Uh, I'm sure there'd be interest. So as far as writing this letter, is there a way who, I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to tell you right now, I'm not going to do it. But is there a way that somebody can integrate the legislative part that, um, that, uh, <clears throat> yes. Yeah, we could. We Lori could. identified in, in like the second sentence of the letter we're writing. If, if you would, um, MA, if you're willing, um, if you would like to designate MA and I to jointly try to reword the letter, integrating that information um, on the state law, mm -hmm. and then sharing that again with you all uh, by email, we could try to get this all sort of done even before the next meeting. Sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm willing to work with you on that, Chris. Okay. And it's, it's to do this, this integrate Lori's, the stuff Lori found out, and then also to integrate what Chris, uh, what Tim just said about. Right. Yeah, uh, I think the second, the second paragraph could start off with the stuff that Lori identified about state law, and then say, you know, we, we basically, uh, town officials and the tree warden need to have enough yearly notice, you know, to provide the necessary oversight. So yeah, great. That would be good if you guys could do that. Yeah. Well, the, this existing state law does mention that the select board, um, you know, could have an opportunity to comment on these annual vegetation management plans, but it doesn't give the select board explicit authority to require them um, or, or any real authority to, you know, to oversee them. Um, right. So I guess what but I'm- it does give it to the tree warden? Um, it gives a certain amount of authority to the tree warden, but I, I think it's a little bit of a weak um, piece of law in that sense. So I, I guess what I'm coming around to is, you know, what are we specifically asking of Natalie and Joe Comerford here? I think what we might want to consider asking them is to strengthen this particular clause in the law so that the select board in each town um, is required to get um, a ve um, vegetation management plan from the utilities and they have the opportunity to to review and comment on those specifically and make changes in them. Does, does that make sense? Sure. <laughs> Tim, you don't, you don't want more work to do. <laughs> I can see her. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it also says that, um, that uh, upon receipt of the plan, the tree warden or designee thereof um, shall notify the utility within 60 days in writing, blah, blah, blah. And it says, um, or approved with modifications agreed to by both parties, which basically says the utility can say no to anything. Um, but yeah, strengthening this would, would be good. I'm sure if we strengthened it, that uh, they'd probably go to the federal government and say, hey, you know, they don't have the authority to regulate this. But yeah, I mean, I think it's a good thing to anything that we can do to move the, you know, a lot of these companies, would rather cooperate if it doesn't really affect them much. Um, so, yeah. The problem. I'll be is, interested to see what you come up with. The problem is this adds another whole layer on their on what they do, and I think that they probably are going to fight it tooth and nail because it's going to require public hearings or public discussion of what they're doing, and I, I it's going to be tough, really. I'm just saying that because DPU requires them, and that's what they're going to do is fall back on DPU requiring them to maintain their lines. 
So yeah, they they have a lot of this documentation. It's just a question of when they submit it. They need to submit it sometime in February so that when the season for maintaining comes around, they will have met the 60 day requirement. And I think that's sort of what they already do. And what we need to do if we get three or four or five or six towns willing to do this, it makes it easier for six tree wardens to get together and, you know, review the plan. It's then, then if one person is responsible and it's only in one town, but, Let's let them finish the letter and see how it looks. And maybe well, get some input from Natalie. I don't know. Um, we right, can I ask think this, this letter is just a way to get the conversation started with yeah. Natalie, and not really to provide all the solutions necessarily. True, good point. And I, I'm, I guess I'm just wondering if we so, feel like in our community, you? the problem is that the tree warden's not engaged enough or it is, is it, should it be another board that has that engagement with this process? You, you know, it's, what do you think, Carolyn? I, I think, I mean, I'm willing to try anything. I'm just trying to be realistic that not to. Oh, yeah. I mean, let's try it. I, I always feel like regionally, if you're together, you're going to have a higher, a, a much better voice. And also, I don't know the situation of the tree wardens in the other towns, but our tree warden is just a highway guy and, you know, he's not going to raise too much. I mean, they look at clearing off the trees as less work for them after a storm because our highway department has to, like after that last storm in, in March, that big heavy snow, I mean, they spent two weeks chipping up stuff. So I'm not sure if our tree warden is really the person we want advocating for this anyway. Yeah, it could be, could be conservation commission. I mean, we have a forester on the conservation commission. Although the conservation commission is getting so much work now that the conservation commissioners are wondering whether they want to be involved. Um, all yeah, right. The tree warden is an elected position still or not? No. It's in our highway department. Okay, so it's not elected anymore and it's stuck in the highway department or it's not stuck? Yeah. Well, it's part of the highway department. Our, he has a small stipend. He's supposed to be getting training, going go to training and have a higher level of training and a commitment to it. But... Well... You know, so can we shift that responsibility to somebody who's got more interest in it? Well, like Chris said, I think you're right. Let's finish a letter to Natalie to bring the problem up and then work on solutions in a second phase. And is this letter just to Natalie? Because before it was to Joe and Natalie. Both of them. I don't see why. Yeah, both. I would do both. I would do both. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, and I'm not reaching out to the other four communities at this point. Well, I think having an initial outreach to see if they're interested and then saying that we're going to share a letter with them as soon as it's finished would be a, a, maybe a good approach. That's what I did with Sunderland. Um, yeah, I, I'd prefer to um, have the letter in hand and share yeah. it with them before rather than just say there is one. So okay. let's get finish the letter, let's, share it with them and say, the hey. Letter done. Will you, okay. will you will you as towns want to be a part of this? Yeah. yeah. Great. Okay. Sounds good. Um, so anything else on that topic? Okay. So um, the next thing on the agenda I wanted to talk a little bit about is um, maintenance of rain gardens. Um, this is going to be something that we need to sort out for the if we get the rain gardens built in the new grant, we're gonna to need to sort that out. But we have an issue with the existing rain gardens at the um, elementary school. There are two of them. And um, we need to do some maintenance on them. They're, you know, they're, they've been sitting there over the winter and there's a lot of dead plants and weeds in them and there's some trash and things that have gotten into them. Um, so I was hoping that maybe our committee might be willing to 
to have a, 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 a half day work day to just clean up the rain gardens. And I know Carolyn and Tim, I, I might even like specifically exclude you from that request because you've got so much else going on in your lives. But um, is that something that the rest of us might consider doing? I think it's only gonna take a couple of hours to do. It's not a big project. Um, and maybe we could get some uh, elementary school folks involved in it as well, potentially. Yeah, Emmy. Emmy, uh, go ahead. I, I don't think this is a long-term solution to maintaining uh, climate kinds of <laughs> things that we're going to end up doing. I think the highway department, it's overworked and I understand, but uh, I, I think that, you know, we could, we could come up with something for this year, but then we'd have to reorganize it for next year. And if it's all volunteer, um, if, if the town's committed to this, I think the town needs to be taking care of it eventually. Uh, on, the, on the flip side of that for this year, I'm pretty sure I could come up with three or four people who'd be willing from our um, condo association to help out with cleaning those up. We could also ask Annie Curtis, who's a DES school board member, whether yeah. she, you know, but I agree. I think basically rain gardens that are built for the town need to be treated like culverts or any other infrastructure. Just the idea that um, oh, I don't really know that these things do any good is not a reason why if you're the head of the department that you don't maintain these things. And it's, <laughs> it's a manager's responsibility to figure out how to manage the responsibilities that he has under him or her. So, um, so I think you're correct that this year we could do it and next year we need to figure out a way to um, get these things to be recognized as part of the solution and not just extra work. Um, and I agree with that. Well said. We absolutely have to have a work list and know what, what our departments are doing and not doing. So yeah, I'm, I'm I think we could I'd like to actually figure out if we could put out a contract for mowing the cemeteries in town and freeing up DPW workers to do something other than mowing lawns and chipping branches. Um, but that's a longer, that's a select board issue. <laughs> um, so I think I'm pretty sure we could probably get Laurie Busada involved in this as well. And Emma, if you've got potentially three or four people. I mean, I can, I can, I can bring some folks in. I think it's a good idea to get the some elementary school kids doing it too. So which would mean that Lori might not be able to because it would be weekday. Right. School time. I know there was, I know there was a little um, garden in the, by the nursery school. And uh, Victoria and I had done that for years to maintain that. And it hasn't been done, I think, for a while, but. You know, there's certainly Victoria and I can run down there and do try to do some stuff at some point. I, I don't know when, but, um, <laughs> um, you know, we, we try to clean it up because, or, or have over the years, and we haven't done anything for two or three years for sure, but. No, Yankee Candle, doesn't it have some, they, they have rain gardens in the green strip between the parking lot and the, and the highway, right? I think they do. I mean, I wonder if we could, I'm not asking them to do it, but get advice about a reg, a reg, maybe we get the DPW to go over there and learn how to do it. Um, We've had training, Tim, in the past. Okay. And that's, and so, that's part of the Owen, said. Owen, Owen Wormser um, contract was, is going to be to train our highway department how to maintain the buffer along the Bloody Brook when that gets in. Okay. There, there has been training. Is there any chance that Owen might be able to come out for an hour or two um, to work with us on these rain gardens? Um, well, until we have no more money to hire him until we get this grant. So okay. it may be, it may be Chris, but I don't know. Like I said, we've been hearing that the money's coming as you know, since yeah. this. So I'm not sure when this is actually going to get awarded. I don't know that this would be appropriate 
but um, Dig and several other groups are organizing Pride Party. Maybe we could get them to, you know, do something. I could talk to, you know, Lou Vincent and just say, any interest in in like a two hour work session before the party that um, that you could get a small group of people that we could work with. Um, then we could have a community action. You know, this group did this work and uh, blah blah blah. It's you know. I I have to tell you I I don't understand. It's not a huge lift to do these rain gardens, which right. is different than. Uh, That's why I said I can get three or four people from the condos to go over there and, and take care of it. I, I, I'm sure I can do that. And yeah. just tell me when you want it done. We, we should. That's great. We're, no, all, we're, we're all retired. <laughs> if, if you had three or four people and we had, you know, three or so people from our yeah. committee, you yeah. could probably so, do it in, in an hour. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it's not a huge project, so. Okay. But if you just well, let me know um, when, when it's gonna happen, with a couple of days notice, I'm pretty sure I can round some people up. The only, the only thing I want people to be careful of is whoever is in charge of this, let's make sure you have someone that can identify the good plants and weeds. Because they're only right. picking out of weeds. And, right. only, and you want to make sure your native rain garden plants are having not to struggle. So, you know, some, some of the plants need to be cut back not pulled up because they are part of the rain garden. It's just that they are more vigorous than some other kinds. So, so neither MA or I have had the training for this. Um, and I'm not great at plant identification. Do you know I'm anybody? I'm not bad, but the people I'm bringing in are also not bad. They do a lot of gardening. They oh, don't necessarily, if you give us a list of plants that were planted in there, I mean, I just, I. I don't know what was planted in there. So originally. Yeah, I think we might still have that list MA. So that, that's probably a great way to go. Yes. Yeah, because literally... you can just look them up on your phone. Right. <laughs> if you have the name, you can get a picture of it and you know, you'll know what it is. So if you have that list, that'll right. make it much easier. Then that's all, the, that's all the training you need is just to have someone be observant and know what plant they're actually, I mean, uh, right. what, they're, what they're pulling and what they're gonna cut back. That's all. Could the DPW person be involved also just so that he's got some skin in the game? Uh, there's nobody assigned to rain garden maintenance. Oh. So mm -hmm. this would be something in the future that, that we, would, <laughs> we would bring up as um, part of the duties of the, <laughs> We, we had, we put in the budget a few years ago for part-time summer help to mow the cemeteries. Apparently there just isn't anybody interested in mowing the cemeteries, but to have our full-time highway benefited highway department mowing lawns does not seem to be the proper use of our highway department. But at the moment, there's not another choice, so. Did I mean, you know that Carolyn's in a different time zone? It's, it's quarter of 10 in her house. <laughs> You're oh, yeah. hey, You're, I haven't even I haven't even rung my I mean I haven't even wound up my clock it's going real slow I know <laughs> I know I, that's how bad it is I'm sorry <laughs> so Chris we'll, 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 could, we'll talk about the rain garden stuff also as yeah. when we do that letter we'll yeah out. and I'm happy to come help if, you know as long as it's an hour, an hour and a half. Yeah, that's awesome, Tim. I'm okay. not going to volunteer because I haven't done any of my own yard work. <laughs> <laughs> my own right. garden is looking pathetic. You've got, you've got a full plate anyway. Um, okay, so um, other issues. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you guys have other issues. The one I wanted to just bring up briefly again um, and I probably sound like a broken record at this point, but uh, the climate change website information that we developed um, in our previous grant really needs to be on the town website. And especially now when they're gonna be evaluating our grant application and um, you know, they'll probably actually look at the town's website to see if we have 
posted all the stuff that we said we were going to do. Um, so, so far it's not there. And, um, you know, there's a lot of money that went into putting that stuff together and a lot of volunteer time from some of our guest speakers and from FCAT. We did videos um, that took a lot of effort and time to put together. Um, and so I think really trying to figure out a way to get those on the website. I know it's one more piece of work that nobody has time to do. Um, but do we have a website consultant or anything like that? that we yeah, can... just a quick question. Um, wh what does it consist of and where can I find it? Because I'm happy to put anything on the website we need to. <laughs> Well, now, Chris, um, I think both Chris's, um, I think Pat Kroll helped Jennifer um, when they were going through the transition. And I think one of the things that was, was the plan that they had a certain number of pages that they could get under the contract and that they were going to do other things later. So <clears throat> with Chris Curtis's help, identifying what needs to be up there and maybe set a priority list maybe Pat Kroll could help find this stuff. I don't know if there's an archive of the old page that still exists, um, but it's working with the, the web page um, company. Um, we should be able to identify this stuff, but I think Chris Curtis, you should provide a priority of what needs to go up there the quickest, and then we can flesh it out. Because okay. FCAT probably has its stuff, they can they can identify it. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's a great idea, Tim. Um, and I'm happy to provide a priority list, but I, I also think your point about the archive of the older material is vitally important because um, I was hoping the town had archived it so that we could just simply transfer it over. If I have to go find all this stuff, it's gonna be a lot harder. Um, because it was, you know, the website was where where it was residing previously. So some of it, some of it resides with FCAT. I hope they have archived it um, as well. Um, but you know, again, if we have to go chasing it down, it will be much tougher than if the town has an archive somewhere. So, so this is the first I'm hearing of it, but I'm happy to check in with Civic Engage, who's the company that provides our website, um, over if they have anything archived. I'm not sure. Do you know? If it was its own specific page regarding climate change? Um, was it just a, yes. a generic page that you could click to from the main page? It was It was its own separate section of the website and it had lots of different arms to it. So there was a lot of material there from our two climate forums, for example. Okay. Um, and uh, there were some fact sheets on different <laughs> aspects of climate change. And then there were some videos that we specifically created with guest speakers from um, other entities around the region talking about climate topics that were really well done and useful um, materials. Was it, was it MVP and then inside MVP climate or was it right on the front page? I think there was a link on the front page. Um, That's my recollection. Yeah. OK, because we have some stuff filed under the select board, like the Healthy Soils Plan and stuff like that. Yeah, that I, I saw that, but that's that's not what I was talking about, right, really. Right, but we should combine everything, and we shouldn't have people. It, it would be really ideal if there's a way we could create a link off the front page to for people to get to it because people have to dig into some other portion of the website and try to excavate it somewhere. I, I don't think anybody's going to use it really. Um, so that would be a question for the web consultant is can they can they create a link on the front page? Sure, yes. I will dig back in the files and see if I can find anything that meets the description of what you're talking about. And if not, I can get in touch with our contact from the website company and see if there's a way to either recover what was lost with the old website with that specific description um, or what our best course of action should be otherwise. Chris, that would be fabulous. Thank you very sure. much. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. This has been an, a long-standing issue. Yeah, sure. 
Yeah, and there is one section on the website, Chris, that is under latest news. It's the green mm -hmm. background um, on the right of the page, and like it leads with assessors online mapping property records. At the bottom one is municipal guidance for flood emergencies, and so maybe this box would be an appropriate place for a climate resiliency, you know, efforts, or I don't know what it would be considered, but they may have a better idea via the web folks. Because one of the things is that this front page doesn't really have a huge amount of information that's easy to access. In some ways, this is not as good a website as the one we had, um, but it's the one we have, so. I am, I am so thrilled that you said that, Jim, because I was thinking like, this is so hard to use. I cannot stand it. Yeah. <laughs> I had the same experience myself. I thought the old website was much more user friendly. But anyway, I got the joy of experiencing the old one, so I'll take your word for it. Oh, the no. old one sucked too. Emma, your hand is up. I think you have a comment. Yeah, I, I just, I just have a quick comment, uh, unrelated to anything so far. Um, Sherry Morgan organized a meeting with uh, Melissa Hoffer's assistant or not assistant, but like second in command of the climate uh, czar's office, whatever it's called, um, at, at the state. It was really good. It had probably 15 or 20 of us from rural communities around Franklin County, a couple of Hampshire County towns. And we just met with the guy, Jonathan, somebody or other, um, for almost an hour telling him what, why these small rural towns can't possibly get done what's expected of them or what they want to do uh, around climate change. And uh, he was a really good listener. Um, and I would say the takeaway from it was that he is really looking at, um, at uh, FERCOG, at the UMass site, at MVP of strengthening all of those programs and making them more accessible and, and uh, doable, both with resources and other ways of helping small rural towns. So that was just a really, it should make a difference. They, they're, these folks are definitely committed. <clears throat> Melissa Hoffers from Barry and raises goats so uh, she's rural. And uh, so I think, you know, I'm hoping that something good comes of these conversations and they're going to continue. He's going to reach out to both FERCOG and um, the other uh, planning commissions and, and try and figure out a way of making it much easier for us, both with resources and other ways to, to, to get the job done that we need to get done. You know, you know, I mean, I, I really wish I had known about that meeting and if you could loop me in if there's a follow up to that, because uh, I would have a lot to say about that topic. Um, having I, just uh, There were lots of people there who had lots to say and and yeah, um, so anyhow, we can go this is Sher this is Sherry's work. It wasn't me. Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> um, do we need to set an up next meeting date? Yeah, we do. Um, so a June meeting date. Uh, I don't know what folks' schedules are, or if you people need to take a summer hiatus for some period of time, or what. What I just open to open it up to you all to have that discussion. Well, I think it's worth having. Um, I would rather skip in the summer, July, versus um, or August versus uh, June because we have end of the year, you know, um, and the start of the new fiscal year. So I think it's good to be on top of stuff. Yeah, that um, makes sense. Um, if it's what day of the week works for the rest of us, like, I mean, Lori wasn't here today. I don't know if that was because of a school conflict or I know she's been able to be, usually Thursdays work for her, but maybe it doesn't work for other people. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday for me. Oh, <laughs> okay. 
So Emily's saying Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. We don't know for sure about Lori's schedule in the summer. Well, school um, will be out maybe by the time the next meeting happens. What about right. the 12th of June? When does school out by then? No, yeah. school's not out till the 21st or 22nd, I think. Oh, it isn't? Are they, are they on the, are they, are they on the uh, public school calendars? The well, the June nineteenth is a Juneteenth day is a holiday, and I know they have probably at least two half days, the twentieth and twenty first, already because of snow days. So um, we we would still have to meet like at eleven fifteen if we're going to do Lori, and but it really doesn't wow. matter to me. I'm I'm available that week, the twelve the week of the twelfth. I'm available. Um, so you want to pick uh, um, is is everybody who's in attendance today available on the twelfth? I am. Yep. So yes. why don't we just pick the twelfth? Yeah, let's just do eleven fifteen on the twelfth. Okay. And, Great. And Chris is gonna um help he'll, he'll uh uh, posted as a select board meeting as well, so that Tim and I both can come. Great. Okay. It's not, thanks, it works for me. thanks everybody so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Hope you have a good. Thanks for writing, working on the letter. You too. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, I'll All right. make I'll make a motion to adjourn the select board meeting. Second. All those in favor. Tim Hilchey, aye. Carolyn Ness, aye. Okay, we're done. <laughs>